Hi, welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers. I'm Mark Owen, and each week I invite a panel of business experts to join me to talk about the national newspapers, find out what's happening in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. I've got a fantastic panel of guests, but before I introduce them, I'd just like to say a big thank you to our sponsorship sponsors, Hayeswoods, business advisors and accountants, and they make wonderful tea as well, if you can see it there. Right, OK, we're going to find out what's in the national news, courtesy of the BBC, first of all. So let's have a look what's making the headlines. Say yes to end strike, says the Metro. The Times, unions back fair rise for unions on the NHS staff. It's about 5% pay offer. Victory for common sense and patience, says the Daily Mail. The Sun, carry on nurse. The Mirror, nurses deal at last. The I, NS, NHS pay deal signals end to wave of public sector strikes. The Daily Telegraph, Labour's pension tax raid plan will hit millions. The Financial Times, I like the, 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 the one at the top actually gets my eye more than anything else. Poland to send jets to Ukraine. The Guardian, uh, uh, the unions hail pay victory at health secretary rises offer. The Daily Mail, beyond parody. And the, and the Daily Star, Generation Z. Oh. And that uh, obviously is all the newspapers. Okay. If you like the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And today I'm going to start with Len. Len, what's caught your eye on the paper? Hi. Okay, so uh, some of those headlines that are there. So in the Times, I'm going to have to turn it around so I can read it now. Dash to retire before Labour reverses tax-free allowance plan. So this will be a reference to the budget, which we'll probably talk about a little bit later. So, so what, what Labour has said is that as a result of the changes in the budget, what will probably happen, this is their uh, take on it, is that if they were to get into power, then if those uh, changes were to be re re reduced and then taken away, what could happen is that all those people that we thought were going to stay into um, into into the labour market you know, be, and continue their careers will actually rush to retire. Uh, I'm not sure I massively agree with that statement because the rules around the way the pensions would work would probably carry on the same regardless of whether you retired or not. And, and I think this is an attack on the change to the lifetime allowance. And also, it's got my least favourite word in that article as a tax advisor, which is the word loophole, which I absolutely detest. Uh, and the reason I detest that is because it gets used as a way to sort of suggest there's some sort of back, back door way into avoiding tax. And the reference here is to um, pensions could be used to avoid inheritance tax. Well, Parliament decided that pensions are a way to avoid inheritance tax. It's not a loophole. It's what the rules are. So uh, that's, as I said, I wanted to just highlight one of my least ever favourite words that gets used in the, uh, in the press. Um, from the Sun. So this is a quote from Hunt. High taxes here for a while. Uh, that's it. You have to be really careful when you hold up the sun, don't you? Because you don't quite know what you're going to be letting the world see. So I had to fold that one over a bit. Um, yeah, yes, uh, Jeremy Hunt, this is really confirming something he said all along, which is the way to get to battle inflation isn't to reduce taxes. So he's just, uh, the sun's highlighted that and he's standing by his word that the way to uh, change the economy, economy isn't to make people <coughs> or allow people to pay less tax. And I just thought I'd go across the channel here um, in the Daily Telegraph. Um, I can't speak French, but I'm going to give it a, tr a try. Uh, 64 ans, c'est non, which is that uh, what they're trying to do is increase the pension age from 62 to 64. Can you remember when we thought pensions were 60 for women and 65 for men, and now it's 67, probably going on to 68? They obviously have a very different view of that over there. That's the left wing party, not surprisingly. Um, complaining there, but they're actually got a pension age of 62, which I, gosh, wouldn't we like that? You're up about a, so, without a shadow of a doubt. If you run your own business, you're never really going to retire. Anyway, that this brings me very nicely to Anne Harrod. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. So, what have you caught in the papers, please? Thanks for that, Glenn. Good morning. Um, well, Last time I was on, I said this, and I'm going to say it again. I don't buy newspapers. This is this is quite. Um, I'm not a particularly well qualified person to comment, so I always find it interesting when I ever mooch through them because I, as a human being, tend to try and avoid them a little bit. Um, they make me a bit sad. Um, so I found two stories that really jumped out at me. One was actually the front page of the Mail. I mean, you can't miss it. 
that Oxfam have introduced a guide um, for people on how really they should speak um, and various words that would be best they didn't use because our language um, is very colonial and they've apologised that the guide is written in English, which is wonderful. Um, advising not to use words like mother um, and um, uh, they should use parent instead. Um, you know, it's the whole pregnant people thing rather than women. And it just, I, just, I cannot grasp the insanity of the situation we find ourselves in at the moment with this whole what you can and can't say and and like basically trying it for me it seems that they're just trying to lose um you know women and it's it's quite shocking to to hear that you know people shouldn't you know women who have children shouldn't be called mothers and you know you shouldn't be called a pregnant woman you should be called a pregnant person and why oxfam feel the need to do this i don't know i mean they're supposed to be solving world hunger um and i just i had to bring it to the table because it's just ridiculous um so I totally agree with you. the world's gone barking mad what else uh, <laughs> insane and then um i found um TikTok. so i don't know whether you've noticed that the, they've banned um uh, phones having TikTok on government based phones because they're convinced that the Chinese are spying on us, um, which there are one billion TikTok users worldwide. And I think it was just that that shocked me that, you know, a few years ago, this didn't even exist. And now it is in every home and it's it's just terrifying. Um, and the US are trying to get the Chinese to divest who actually owns this. Um, and, you know, the, the America are considering banning it completely in the States. Um, it just I find the whole thing fascinating. So I just had to raise that. Um, and if I've got time, there was one more little tiny story in the mail about um, the post office horizon scandal. Um, don't know whether any of you are familiar with this. Sub postmistresses and masters were um, accused by Royal Mail of stealing money. And I had to raise it because at the time this happened, I was a sub postmistress and I went through um, the the scandal. Luckily for me, it was the tune of a few grand, not the tens and hundreds of thousands of pounds that some people went through. I thought I was going insane, so I just put the money in myself. But they're paying people back, but they're taxing them on it as well. And I just thought, what an absolutely just, can I say dick move? There you go, I've said it. So there you go. That's me and my take on the news today. Well, I can tell you for the post office thing, I think you're quite entitled to say exactly what you want to say. Thanks ever so much for that and uh, for being so honest about it as well. James, thanks for joining Punchline Talks today. What have you picked out from the papers, please? Oh, thanks, Mark. First of all, it's uh, it's Red Nose Day today, if you weren't aware of it. And I'm wearing red because it's wearing red. We're all wearing red at uh, GP, GP Home Surveys. Um, I thought it was quite fascinating that um, you can't buy a red nose uh, on the high street. Um, I tried to get a red nose uh, for today and you can only get them from Amazon. Uh, and uh, if you're an organiser like I am and want a red nose on Red Nose Day, uh, Amazon Prime will deliver it tomorrow, which is not Red Nose Day. So I thought that's quite interesting, uh, not quite in the papers, uh, but anyway. So I thought I'd just mention the budget, obviously, you know, big, big in the news this week. Um, my company uh, provides surveys of residential properties. It was slightly disappointing that there was nothing in the budget um, to help buyers um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, given that the affordability for property is that it's, uh, is that it's uh, uh, lowest for, for, for decades. Um, and, you know, there was nothing within the, within, within the budget at all, really, uh, for, 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 for that. I thought that was a little bit disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, however, no, there were forecasts that were, were that were that were just that we went through in the budget from the OBR saying that they think house prices will come down by about 10%. But of course, that's a national picture, uh, and I don't know whether and I don't believe that that will be um, uh, quite a drop within our region, London and the southeast, given the amount of properties and the price of properties. Um, has such an influence on the national picture. I don't think it would be quite uh, 10%. That said, um, some of the things that were in the budget in, in particular that help with um, um, uh, um, 
ch childcare and the fact that um, you know younger children will now be able for uh, you know free free uh, free places at nursery and childcare will 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 have a, a potential impact on the property market because when lenders look at the affordability um, uh, for mortgages, which has become more and more strict over the last uh, few years, uh, one of the things they look at is the cost of childcare. So if that is you know coming down, then the affordability of mortgages potentially um, is is is, uh, is is a lot is a lot better. So. Um, so uh, I think I'll, also, I'll, I'll stop you there. I never that never even occurred to me that actually the whole childcare thing would have a knock on effect to the housing market and where you live, obviously. And there are some there are some schools of thought that actually, if we're not mentioning the property sector, then it's okay, then the property sector is probably okay, and it's almost kind of you know no no news is good news. So if, you know if we look at kind of glass half full, then and then there's certainly you know that's that's there's some good signs still uh, for, for the for the property market that there wasn't a need for any significant intervention okay have you got anything else uh, there's um, a, yes, no, I, just, I thought it was quite interesting a little kind of art, a little article well, got two more very quick things is that uh, rolls royce uh, you know have been given a grant from the from the government um, um, to provide mm -hmm. or to start to provide a nuclear reactor for the moon which I thought that was quite interesting. So a nuclear reactor that could provide electricity and life support communication systems for astronauts on the lunar base. Hopefully electricity in, on the moon is far cheaper than it is down here. Maybe if we've got electricity from the moon, it might be a little bit, a little bit cheaper. And the one last thing I wanted to say is obviously spring is around the corner and as well as of getting a hot tub, which I have done from from from, 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 from uh, hot tub rocks, which I can highly uh, recommend, is uh, the, 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 the spring is around the corner, although it doesn't feel like it. It was an article in The Times yesterday where England's uh, cricketers fast bowler Ollie Robinson's warns Australia they could receive a good hiding in the ashes. The springtime always is, is the change of the seasons, warmer, and that means <clears throat> Christmas season for me. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a nice long hot summer and to give the uh, the, the Australians a good hiding? Well, it's funny you should mention England because obviously you don't want to talk about the rugby, do you? And that leads me very nicely. That leads me very nicely to my friend, a Scotsman. Hey, Colin, thanks for joining us today. Mark, thank you. Right, okay, Colin, what's caught your eye in this week? Uh, sorry, what's caught your eye in the papers today, please, in the news? Okay, um, the in in Pulse, which I read quite a lot. Um, NHS health checks, bear with me, yeah, NHS health checks to become digitized as uh, spring budget confirmed. So um, I think this is a really, really good thing. And what we've done, is we, we've learned a lot from COVID and getting people to uh, do their own tests, that's digitized and it sends the results in. And they trialed in Cornwall, Cornwall was the first area back in December 2022 where they trialed uh, the NHS di digital health checks. And it's obviously from those trials, they've done the, they've looked at all the data and the research and they're now going to roll that out across the country. And I think it's really, really important that we take the pressure off the NHS, we take the pressure off GP surgeries and the doctors, um, and we're responsible for our own health. And, you know, um, it's a common sense thing, isn't it? Look after yourself, although common sense is not that common these days. Uh, we do need to look after our own health. So what it means is that from home, instead of going to the GP surgery, you can do a digital check where you'll fill in a questionnaire. Uh, there's a little cut to take a blood, uh, a little uh, kit to take a blood sample. Also, you can do a blood pressure check at a local pharmacy that will then be uploaded and then they can analyze, analyze that data and, and determine whether you need to see a doctor or whether you need to go for um, any additional care. And uh, it's going to take the pressure off the doctors. I mean, if you look at the population of the UK, there's 67.3 million people in the UK. How many people do you think have got cardiovascular disease? No, no idea. 6.8 million. So that's 10% of the UK population have got cardiovascular disease and it's getting worse. And the reasons why they've got cardiovascular disease is because of unhealthy diets, um, lack of physical activity, smoking, harmful use of alcohol. Um, and they've all got, they're all indicators and they're all factors that lead to cardiovascular disease. So um, 
you know, I've got high blood pressure and I went for my hypertension test the other day and I got a phone call from the GP to say, you need to see the doctor. I'm like, right, brilliant. Okay. When can I see him? Well, the earliest appointment's in four weeks. I could be bloody dead by then. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, so, that is the hardest thing of all, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. So I've got a blood pressure monitor at home. I do check my blood glucose and, you know, I have had a nutritional change and I do do exercise because my blood pressure is high. But, you know, you, you need encouragement to do that. You also need help to do that. But you also need advice from professionals. But if you can't see them for four weeks, then, you know, they're under that much pressure. We need to ease it somehow. So I think this is a really good thing. But Colin, the big thing is, let's be honest, we all run our own businesses. Yeah. And the amount of pressure that we're all under on a continual basis. I mean, it's well known. And, I, you know, I don't hide from the fact I had a heart attack eight years ago. And I do blame the fact that it was just stress related, uh, unhealthy diet, not enough time to exercise. You know, I was very lucky to be here. But the yeah. continual pressure on you all the time is very difficult to switch off. I mean, Anne, Anne Harrod, you, you run your own business. Do you feel it as well? Do you... Well, I was told this week that I'm suffering from burnout. So, um, but it's, yeah, you know, I couldn't agree more. It's, we don't allow ourselves the time. I think it's half the problem um, to look after ourselves. Personally, for me, it's all about looking after the business, looking after the children, looking after everyone else. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this sounds like a great idea. And it, it, it doesn't help as well that um, I was hoping that the government would do a little bit of a U-turn on corporation tax, but they didn't. No. Um, well, you know, as a business owner, you've got all this pressure, haven't you? More corporation tax, NI has gone up and it's just... Yeah, hourly, hourly, hourly rate, the minimum wage has gone up. Yeah, yeah it's gone hospital. up as well. I mean, how much more is there in the pot for us? Yeah, as a as you know, you talk to anybody in the hospitality trade. You know, we had Lindsay Holland from last week um, from a hotel. Oh my goodness! You know, the cost of her energy has gone up through the roof. Yeah. She can't raise the cost per room that she can hire out. Anyway, thanks ever so much for that, Colin. I'm going to go back up, Glenn. Let's talk about the, the budget again. Obviously, you you know, tax expert, tax guru at Hazelwoods. And um, what is your overall take on the budget? I mean, uh, if we're just literally sort of restricting our conversation to tax, then obviously there wasn't a huge amount to talk about because anything of any interest had already been announced in the previous uh, autumn budget. Um, I'll actually I'll jump onto the uh, corporation tax point on a couple, a couple of things, actually. And this isn't specifically budget related, but it's, it's uh, anybody watching who runs their own business or businesses. This is particularly effective and uh, particularly important. So. If you're in a company, you've uh, we've already heard that um, corporation tax is changing. It was 19%. Uh, it's going to go to 25% if your profits are over a certain level. So if you're a small bit, very small business, you'll carry on at 19%. Now, to get the, to get from 19% to 25%, that's, there's something in the middle called a marginal rate. So actually, if you're above £50,000 of profit, you might find some of your profits are being taxed at 26.5%. That's frustrating as it is. But what I'll just bear in mind is if you've got more than one company, so let's just imagine that you're, you've got your main business, and let's say it's construction for the sake of argument. Uh, in fact, let's just say you're actually a general small builder, but you've also on the side, you've also thought, well, I'm going to rent out some property and, I've, and I've, I'll have a completely separate company for that. When you're working out your corporation tax, all the rates that are used to determine whether you pay tax at 19%, 26.5% or 25% are halved. So what you could actually find is that while you're, let's just say your rental business is making profits of £20,000, it pays tax at 19% because it's quite small, whereas your larger business will could actually find that you're paying tax at 26.5% when previously you were paying it at 19%. It's difficult to solve that problem, but it is a problem that needs to be addressed, I think. Um, and also there was another announcement in the budget, which was to do with um, what we sort of call capital allowances. Now, I'm going to start this off by saying that it only affects very large businesses, which is going to be 1% of, of all businesses, but actually, economically, it should have a wider effect than that. And that was that if you spend more than a million pounds on capital, yeah, and I appreciate that sounds a lot, then, if, then you can write that off in, uh, against your profits of that year. And I probably, they, they've said that 99% of 
um, businesses never even spend more than a billion pounds. Appreciate that sounds a bit odd, but what we need to bear in mind is that that means that those big businesses are more likely to cascade down all those purchases to the smaller to the SMEs. So what we hopefully will see is that uh, while the, the big businesses who are looking to spend 50 million pounds over the next five years or something might actually say, well, I'll tell you what, we're getting a write off straight away. Let's accelerate that. And then hopefully that will that will cascade down into the, you know, into the more local markets. So um, so we, we should see a bit more growth for everybody, because really that's what that is. That's not meant to be a tax giveaway. That's meant to be a way to accelerate the economy and, and deal with all the issues. That we've got so suddenly you're, you're, you're redoing your website, you're updating your PC, you're going to a local supplier, buying new telephone systems, all that kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. M imagine your um, imagine your big business has got a two million pound spend on 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 IT infrastructure in its one of its offices. Well, rather than perhaps spread it over a few years, they might say, "Well, let's just go straight for it. And we'll do the whole lot in one go." And then it obviously brings all the economy, it, all, all the spending forward, and helps everybody. And of course, that could apply to the construction industry as well, the fit outs and, and all this kind of thing. Okay, that's really interesting. Thanks ever so much for that, Glenn. I think the big big thing for all of us is you've got to make a profit in the first place. And that leads <laughs> back over to Anna Herron. Obviously, Absolutely. I was down there making a video with you uh, last week. I really enjoyed it. And Herod, thanks ever so much for showing me around. Um, how is business now? You know, tell us a little bit about Hot Tubs Rocks. Okay, um, so Hot Tubs Rock started in 2015. We started out just hiring hot tubs. Um, and then in 2020, when the world went mad and everybody wanted a hot tub, we started selling them. So it it accelerated our business plan because it gave us the capital to be able to invest in a showroom and have a um, retail public facing um, space, which Mark came to see on Monday in the rain. Um, so we are obviously massively affected at the moment by energy costs. Um, so people are afraid, I guess is the right word, um, to, to, to spend money on things that cost money to run. Um, so we're, we, we diversified a little bit in December um, and we opened an interiors and like gifts department within the building. So we've got a whole first floor of like occasional furniture and that's been going really well. Um, and it does show us that money is still out there and people are still spending, um, but you don't have to plug any of that stuff in. So once you've bought it, um, it's not gonna continue to, you know, concern you and i think our media has done a very good job at the moment of, of terrifying people and convincing them that they should just hold on to their money at the moment to see what's coming around the corner what's next you know is, a, is there another pandemic is there a war is there a you know it's just been so catastrophic over the past few years that none mm -hmm. of us know what what to expect next i suppose so for us business has been i would say slow is a fair word um seasonally it always is in winter but it's been exceptionally slow so it's been quite painful but if this weather goes away that we're experiencing now, we've got Easter around the corner, um, then we are hopeful and feeling quite positive about a really good season. So, yeah, it's it's all about people wanting to make their gar improve their gardens. A lot of people who buy a hot tub, it's part of a project, maybe they're extending a bit of something in the garden or doing something. And quite frankly, when it's absolutely bucketing it down with rain or even snow, as we had last week, it's not most people's top priority at the moment so yeah we, we need some good weather please so sundance would be great everyone Thank well you. i've got to take my heart because i mean a lot of different businesses and the way that you've diversified and going into the gifts area and by the way it's, I, I really enjoyed it and some great stuff and i ended up spending around 50 quid there as well by the way so you've got to be quite careful if you go and visit thanks ever so much for that Anna harrod right let's go over to you james james can you tell us all about the the, the business please obviously gb home surveys uh I didn't realise that you're part of Steve Gooch's bunch. Uh, well, we were um, up to about seven, seven years ago, but the GB stands for Gooch and Burley Chartered Surveyors. And that's why people might be thinking, why is GB Home Surveys on a Gloucestershire business news? Um, well, it was started over 30 years ago in Newent by Steve Gooch and Alan Burley. Um, we changed our name uh, or we we now trade as GB Home Surveys. And we changed that name uh, to uh, for the, the Ron Seal effect, I suppose, almost do exactly what, what you say on the, is on the tin. Um, there, there is a change in how people are looking for surveys for their property. Historically, people would have got their surveys through their mortgage lender. They would have gone uh, and you know, through their loan, they would have got a valuation that the mortgage company needed, and then they would have sold them a survey. 
Well, mortgage companies and lenders are using surveyors less and less to do physical inspections for valuations. Uh, the amount of data that's in the, out in the market and the amount of information is out there means that as they manage their risk, they don't need to pay for a surveyor to go and look at the property. They can either do it behind a desk, called a desktop valuation, a drive-by valuation, um, or just using an algorithm on a computer. I know people who have heard of Zoopla and those kind of things, but there are more powerful versions of that that these lend the lenders use. So that means that... Uh, that uh, uh, so a, a, a house before purchase isn't being looked at by a surveyor, not even for, for a, a valuation. And lenders are only ever interested in major, major things that might affect the value. So about 5% usually. So let's say a £200,000 house, they're not interested of £10,000 worth of defects. However, if you're purchasing that property, £10,000 worth of defects is certainly interesting to you. So there is a, a growing awareness that people that are from, from out in the market that, that, that people need a survey because people aren't, you know, there's, there's no surveyors looking at it. And where do they go? Well, they go online straight away, Google and so on and so forth, and they're looking for surveys. So we changed our business with two years ago uh, to GB Home Surveys, and it's absolutely transformed it. Um, we used to be quite reliant on work through big corporations, big lenders. It was uh, well over two thirds of our, of our revenue. Well, now it's less than 10%. And all of our revenue comes from uh, instructions through local uh, businesses, such as estate agents, solicitors, um, accountants, um, but, but, but also through, through, through our online and our digital marketing. Uh, we have a strong presence in Gloucestershire. Uh, we have uh, four, four, four surveyors in Gloucester, cover Gloucestershire, uh, and that is our that is our heartland. Uh, and you know we you know we we've been providing services for over thirty years in this area. So James, do you come out? Do you still come out to the house? So if I if I want to sell my house, you want to find out that I've got damp in the you know in the wall here, and so you do still do that kind of stuff as well. Exactly. That is well. That's predominantly our business now, and we're working for the individual, not for the bank. So you know they're going to find out about the, the, the ten thousand pounds worth of issues that the bank aren't interested in. Um, and I, I know, of course, I own a, a GB, I own a surveying company. I highly recommend that you you get a survey before before you put purchase property. Which is a bit like a medical, a bit like a medical checkup, isn't it? Which was, which is what Colin was talking about at the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't, you know, you need to appoint a conveyancer uh, to make sure everything's legally tied up. But of course, there's no legal uh, obligation to have a survey done. But you could probably going to save more money getting a survey, uh, you know, because of the the issues that we we might find. Um, so yeah, it, it's very important if you're going to be buying a property to to have a pre-purchase survey undertaken that is for you rather than for somebody else. But I, I'll tell you what, I'd definitely like to have another chat with you offline about that as well, if that's okay. Um, thanks ever so much for that. Colin, let's come back over to you, please, mate. You spent a lot of time in the army. You were a medical expert. Tell us all about title training. Well, 10 years you've been going. You go for yeah. strength for strength, isn't it? It is. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah we just... Um, Back in November, we celebrated our uh, 10 year anniversary. And, um, you know, it's um, the last 10 years, uh, it's been fantastic, to be honest with you, Mark. We've, the company has grown exponentially. You know, four years ago, five years ago, actually, it was myself in an office at the back of uh, Royal Crescent uh, in Cheltenham. And now I've got eight staff uh, who are um, on the books and 27 trainers nationally. So, do you just want to get, quickly explain what title training does? Uh, you know, yeah. you say about 27 staff, what do they actually do for you? So, um, my trainers range from psychotherapists to I've got army medics, combat medics, uh, paramedics, mental health nurses, learning disability nurses. Um, you know, specialists in their area, and we provide on-site and live interactive webinar training to organisations ranging from, um, you know, today I've got a trainer doing uh, an audit for an NHS trust, and we're doing some training for a small children's care home. We're training the probation service today a university, a local college, um, a care home as well. 
and two live interactive webinars for schools um, teaching the, the, the teachers and the, the teaching assistants. So the courses range from um, your mandatory basic entry level awareness courses for support workers through to um, psychological first aid, psychosocial uh, risk and debrief facilitator training. And then, you know, learning disability awareness for people who work in the learning disability arena, intimate personal care training for schools, because children don't actually know how to go to the toilet. There's been a 300% increase since COVID. Uh, primary school children not actually being taught how to go to the toilet. So teaching assistants are having sorry, to actually do that. Sorry, mate, a 300% increase of people, teachers, children. children, children not being taught by the parents how to go to the toilet properly. Wow. So teaching assistants and teachers now have to get involved and they have to do that intimate personal care for the children. And with that comes legislation. I mean, these children have got rights. Um, they need dignity, they need respect, they need independence. But, you know, if you're going to uh, be doing that amount of personal care for your child, you need to be trained properly. Not just that, but you need to sort of not be in front of you, you need to back up and everyone to you, yeah, the security yeah, yeah. side of things, exactly. you know, for both sides. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, that's the sort of stuff that we do. You know, we do. We, we're, we've moved into consultancy. We're looking at uh, consultancy as well. Um, so there's no no day is the same. Uh, we've got nine trainers out today. On Monday, we had two tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow. On Monday, we've got another eight out. So, you know, it's it's it's, it's full on, but it's really, really good. And we're growing. Um, I don't want to grow much more. I'm quite happy where we are. <laughs> quite happy where we are because with growth comes more problems and well, you, more you said earlier, you, Well, we said earlier that you're, you're under stress and straining and about, you know, yeah. blood pressure, mate. So why, that's the thing. And the government's going to take more money off you anyway if you grow it to a certain level. Anyway, we're kind of running out of time already, guys. So just very, very quickly, but let's go over what's caught your eye in this week's punch. I'm going to start with you, actually, Anne Harrod. What's caught your eye in this week's punch, please? And you can't say your own company. I really wanted to say my own company, um, but no, it was super dry trial in a four day week. Um, but it was more than it was more than that. It was that there'd been um, trials done for six months and 97 percent of the companies that took part in the trial were going to proceed with a four day week because they saw such benefit in it. And I thought that was amazing. Um, I just, yeah, it really stopped me in my tracks because I would instantly think, oh, you know, four days, they're doing less time and I need them to be working. And it's it's sad, really, the mentality certainly we have as a, being British, you know, work harder, work longer means we're better and we're achieving more. And actually, we're probably not. I know I procrastinate and I probably actually in a shorter period of time would achieve more. So, yeah, I just thought that was really interesting. And it's quite funny, isn't it? I wonder how many of those business owners only work the four day week. I bet they don't. I bet they don't know. James, you'd like to oh. work a four day week? And what's caught your eye in punchline? <laughs> well, I think I think there's something in four day four day weeks, but uh, hopefully no more none of my staff will see see this. But yeah, I think I think there is definitely something in a four day week. I really do. Um, uh, I suppose it's a whole another podcast maybe. But uh, uh, anyway, um, what's caught my eye is low carbon homes going up in Morton Marsh. So uh, what's quite interesting is that there's 15 low carbon homes going up in Morton Marsh, um, and it's the first of their kind in the Cotswolds, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, they're, but they're but they're just very simple, low cost homes, you know, uh, highly insulated, air sourced heat pumps and, and solar panels. There's nothing too revolutionary about that, but they are the first um, supported by a grant from Homes England. Um, and I think that it's really interesting, interesting to me because there is so much news uh, about retrofitting our housing stock with insulation. Uh, I think that is filled with issues. Um, in, in, um, and I won't go into all of that at the moment, I do think it's crazy that we don't have more low carbon, higher energy efficiency within our housing stock that's been currently being built in the UK. Gas boilers still going into properties that are highly insulated. And you know, if we're not doing it into new homes, we think we can suddenly stick them into homes which aren't as insulated, 
it's a, it's a little bit crazy. So it's really good to see that we're seeing these these properties being being built, and hopefully there'll be more of those going up around our around our, our region. James, it drives me bonkers. You know, we've got th we've got thousands of thousands of houses being being built all over our county, and they don't have solar panels on. Why aren't they all <laughs> being built with solar panels on and 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 all yeah. that kind of stuff, EV charging built into the actual cost. Yeah, exactly. When you mortgage your house, it, the cost is already built into it and you just pay it like that. I just don't get it. It's, and it's, like, same it's, as, sorry, you got me on a roll here. Same as warehouses. When you build warehouses, why aren't they all got solar panels on the roof? It's a yeah. no-brainer to me. Sorry, anyway, I'm running out of time, but thank you ever so much for picking that one. Glenn, what have you picked out from this week's punchline, please? I'd like to, of course, pick out the piece on the Gloucestershire LLP and the potential stopping of funding that was announced in the budget. My colleague, um, Ruth Dooley, with her other hat on, is the chair of the local uh, Gloucestershire LLP. And, the, and uh, her defence of the brilliant things that they've done in your article is excellent. I spoke to her beforehand and she just wanted to remind everybody that uh, the funding still goes on till April 2024, whatever happens. It's actually currently up for review. So this isn't ended yet. And there's a four week process that they're going to go through. So really, we need to wait four weeks before we really know what's going to happen. I actually wanted to add a very quick point from the budget, if you didn't mind, just something that people haven't commented on. But it goes exactly in line with what we've just been saying, which is one announcement was made is that officially nuclear power is going to be considered an environmentally friendly source of energy. So I think we'll see some changes because that puts it into a whole different category. And obviously, there's so many manufacturing here that is linked to the nuclear industry. Gloucestershire should do well out of it. That takes place. Thanks for that, Glenn. Colin, what's caught your eye in this week's punchline, please? Um, exactly what Anne Harrod has been speaking about. And I've frantically been on your website having a look for another story. <laughs> uh, there is another story there about right, Superdry wanting to cut costs. Sorry, see me. But yes, that's right. Superdry is there looking to cost costs as well. They they uh, hired a special firm of accountants to have a look at it. Personally, it looks like the company is well. They're in retail. It's tough, isn't it? Let's be honest yes. about it. And yes. and uh, it's tough doing business, as we all know. Guys, yeah. unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. I'd just like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazelwood's Accountants and Business Advisors, my brilliant panel, who I'd like to apologise to because I didn't actually mention who they all were when we first started. And uh, and uh, if you like the show, please like, share and subscribe. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining Punchline Talks. Remember, it's all in the punchline. Bye.